Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back. Um, well, it's good to be back and seeing you all. I don't know. <laughs> we were uh, had some time in the sun and away uh, in the Dominican Republic, and it was wonderful to be away. Uh, it is good to be back to see people. I'm not sure if spring ever comes, it will be good to be back and see some spring. Um, and again, forgive my voice if I sound a little bit like a frog, uh, still getting over this cold that, that I seem to have been bringing back. So, um, but still feeling a lot better today than I was last week, so it's it's good to be here. Um, again, welcome to worship at Calvary Moravian. Um, we are glad to be together, and um, again, I'm very, very grateful. It was my first time being able to watch Facebook um, worship, and um, it felt a little strange. I was kind of like, I should be doing something, and, um, and it was wonderful. So thanks to Kathleen, thanks to uh, Bishop Chris Giesler for being here, uh, did a wonderful job, and to Sharon for uh, such wonderful music I got to listen to. So um, again, thank you for all those who pitched in. Um, our last midweek Lenten program will be this Wednesday, um, dinner at six, and the program, which will feature um, kind of a literal version of cultivating, we'll be hearing from a nonprofit called The Seed Farm that's over in Emmaus, helping local farmers and producing uh, community-supported agriculture. So talking about um, really cultivating the soil and the seeds uh, and you find out more about what they do. So I'm excited for, for that. Uh, we do and will continue to advertise this, our Holy Week readings, what's coming up for the following week. Of course, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and um, it's going to be a wonderful service. We'll have some great music. Um, we, of course, will have our palms and our palm processional, and really looking forward to that celebration of worship together. Uh, next Saturday, right before Palm Sunday, is our Easter egg hunt. And so please spread the word. If you know of kids, uh, families would be welcome to continue to sign up. Um, there's some information about help needed. If you're able to help stuff eggs, um, you can take a few pieces of candy as payment. That's next Friday at 10 o'clock. We're gonna stuff lots of Easter eggs. And um, also if you're able to help um, prepare on Saturday, you're welcome to come a little early. Just let me know if you're interested in helping. So um, looking forward to that. Um, I think those are my announcements. Um, does anybody have anything else to share? <clears throat> okay. If not, uh, I've lost my order of worship. Here it is. If not, let us prepare our hearts, our spirits, and our minds as we usher in the presence of God, the presence of love, and this lingering presence of the power of the Spirit to be with us as we worship. get through this. <laughs> Remind me where I am. Okay. Um, we come before uh, God as we worship using our liturgy for Lent 1. Um, we began our Lenten season on this, and as we're nearing the end of our Lenten season, I thought we'd return to our liturgy for Lent 1. It's found on page uh, 72 in your hymnal. So um, please stand as we pray together. And again, our, our choir... Um, in various forms, we'll supply the choir pieces uh, of our liturgy as we pray together. <clears throat> Lord God, our Father in heaven, 
You have shown your great love toward us by sending your son into the world to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We give thanks because you have made us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, having rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your beloved son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Lord God, Son, the Savior of the world, though you were in the form of God, you did not consider equality with God something to cling to, but emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. You humbled yourself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Your love compels us to live not for ourselves, but for you. We give you thanks because you, our merciful and faithful high priest, have made reconciliation for the sins of the people. You were despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. Upon you fell the punishment that made us whole, and by our wounds we are healed. Lord God, Holy Spirit, one with the Father and the Son, we give you thanks because you descended upon the Christ, anointing him to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and to proclaim release to the captives and re recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the time of the Lord's favor. You fill our hearts with the love of God, and make our bodies your holy temple. You may be seated.
from the sin of unbelief, from all defilement of the body and spirit, from all self-righteousness, from every neglect of our duty, from ingratitude and selfishness, from lukewarmness, from all indifference to your meritorious life and death. Deliver us, gracious Lord and God. By your holy incarnation and birth, by your early exile, by your pure and blameless childhood, by your willing obedience, by your humility, meekness, and patience, by your faithfulness in your earthly calling, by your fasting and temptation, by your perfect life before God and humanity, bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God by your tears and agony, your crown of thorns and cross. Lead us to repentance for our sins. By your willing sacrifice of yourself, even unto death, make known to us the mystery of your love. Into your open arms stretched out upon the cross, receive us all. Please stand. by all your sacred wounds and precious blood, by your innocent suffering and dying, by your rest in the grave, by your glorious resurrection and ascension. Bless us and save us, Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Fulfill in us your prayer that all who love you may be one, as you are in the Father and the Father in you. Hear us and help us, gracious Savior. You have made God known to us as Father, so that the love with which he has loved you may be in us, and you in us. Christ and him crucified remain our confession of faith.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, we have turned our calendar and moved into April, and so just a reminder that our joyful noise that we're collecting for April will benefit the Good Samaritan Fund uh, through Calvary. Uh, it is once in a while that we get requests from perhaps our outside community, but once in a while members of our own community for assistance, uh, financial assistance. Um, often that can be helped in the supply of a giant gift card. Um, sometimes it's gas money. Uh, often what we can do is refer them to places like the Conference of Churches uh, where rental assistance or, or other items can be found. But it is a good thing for us to be able to have a, a small amount of money for a Good Samaritan Fund on hand. So. Um, all throughout April will be collecting in the back for the joyful noise uh, for that fund. Um, again, as we um, call upon Karen to bring forward our morning offerings, we again continue to be grateful for the ways, both financial and in your time and talents, that we can share um, God's blessings with our community and with our greater community. So let's pray as we bring forward. So again, as we come before God, we share in the prayers of community and ask if you have any prayers that you'd like to share of thanksgiving or of concern, uh, we can be together in community. So, um, Karen? Did, I saw that last night on Facebook or somewhere that uh, Greg Wirt passed away suddenly, uh, the owner of Wirt's Cafe. So um, thinking of that family and, uh, and all the community that they touch. So, yeah. Me. Sam? Uh, I have uh, two uh, prayer requests. <clears throat> I just saw in the paper this morning that that horrible accident on Route 81 in yeah. County, I guess six Thank you. So two very local tragedies in both the I-81 uh, huge pile up and the six who passed and the many who were recovering um, and the two young girls who died of the fire in Hellertown just a few days ago. And thank you for remembering them. Um, Sam? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, so um, I think last week, I believe when I wasn't here, Blair was able to share that prayer as well. We were praying for uh, Sam's friend, Caitlin, uh, lost her mother, and uh, also for the extended family or grandmother. So continue to keep those uh, folks in your prayers. Say, uh, seek God's peace. Thank you. Um, as I see Dan, I'm thinking about, um, of course, we continue to pray for the country of Ukraine. Uh, for everyone who is both uh, attempting to continue to work for peace and the incredible refugee crisis we continue to see. Um, we note that we are planning a, um, a benefit um, towards the end of April, April 28th, and we're grateful for the ways that we can do something uh, in this community. So that's kind of a prayer of, of, well, obviously a prayer of peace concern, but also a prayer of thanksgiving for where we're being able to do what we're planted, uh, where we're planted. Oh, thank you. Um, also, prayers, our second soup kitchen team went in on this past Monday to do some serving at the uh, Conference of Churches soup kitchen. Uh, everything went great. Uh, they had uh, three of our volunteers were there and uh, they let me go home because I wasn't feeling too well, so that was also great. And uh, they, they served a great uh, meal to about 90 people there. So continue to be um, in prayer for this, this outreach that we're able to do uh, through the Conference of Churches uh, Soup Kitchen. Uh, so, um, any others? All right, come together in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, come to us today, perhaps from the busy places, the worrisome places, the uncertain places of our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our world. Come to us as we hear or have experienced cases of grief and loss and be with those who are seeking your peace. Come to us as perhaps sometimes the world's challenges seem so immense and we wonder where we are called and what is our role in it all. Come to us today to find the ways that we are called to share your gift of love and to maybe shut off those doubting, nagging voices that tell us it's not enough or it's not the right time or place. But help us, Lord, in the ways that you would lead us, each individual, but also in this community, to share your wondrous gift of love as you have shared with us. And as you have shared with your disciples who you taught over and over, about the ways to share that love with communities that were outcast and forsaken. Thank you for sharing with them this prayer that we'll pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, again, I am grateful to have such wonderful and flexible musicians in our congregation. And if you're looking at your bulletin, this is kind of a choose your own adventure for the musical selection that will come up next. <laughs> we could vote. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, this was done in part because of some lingering colds that were going through my household and not sure of whose voice would be good. So I'm very grateful that it's going to be the second choice this Sunday. Uh, Bob Kale will be joining us and providing some special music for us next Sunday. Knock on wood. Um, we'll be going with choice number one of Christian. So thank you both. Uh, thank you, Bob. And if you came here really wanting to hear Christian, then I'm sorry, but uh, I think. <laughs> All right. Thank
thank you for being gracious and uh, able to share your, your gifts with us. Again, thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for being able to share. And let's walk away. Come on. Good morning. I have to apologize. I just heard about Greg Wirt, and he was a friend of mine, so excuse me. John's Gospel speaks of an event six days before Passover, meaning just a day or two before Jesus' procession into Jerusalem that we celebrate as Palm Sunday next week. Jesus is invited to a meal in his honor at his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. The Gospel is clear to point the difference in actions and intentions of Mary versus Judas. The first reading today is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. 
Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them, the Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow our tears reap with shouts of joy, and those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home and shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. The second reading today is from John 12, 1 to 8. Mary anoints Jesus. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those of the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 demara and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he kept the common purse and he used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. from John's Gospel um, is in all four of the Gospel accounts, um, in some four. Um, all four of the accounts speak of a woman, uh, often unnamed, except in this account, we hear it's Mary, um, that anoints Jesus' feet with this um, jar or vial of pure nard, um, kind of perfumed oil, uh, an essential oil. Uh, it's often mentioned uh, in these accounts, first of all, of the expense of this perfumed oil that uh, she is using. In John's account, uh, we hear that it's nearly a full year's wages, uh, 300 denarii, so it's a lot of money um, for that time, for any time. Uh, it's also often mentioned in three out of four of the accounts of the reaction to this extravagant expense, um, often by the disciples, or in John's account, uh, by Judas, only by Judas himself, uh, kind of in a challenging of this action, of pouring out this immense amount of expensive oil. There's this reaction and challenge. Um, and here's what Judas says when he witnesses Mary spreading out the perfumed oil on Jesus' feet. He says, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Or I could rephrase that in, what about selling this and giving it to the poor? And I rephrase it because as I was reading a description of this story uh, from a commentary, they said, well, Judas, of course, was using a what about ism And I thought, a what about what? Um, what is a whataboutism? And that's something you can say three times fast. Uh, but what is a whataboutism? I didn't realize, maybe I should have, um, that a whataboutism is a, a long standing debate tactic. Uh, there's actually a definition of this. Um, it's a debate tactic that is used by folks to distract or deflect the original issue that is being brought up. Most people use the what about, um, who use this, are not really interested, this is the definition of a what aboutism. What most people who use this what about are not really interested in the original issue, but rather they are using their what about selling this for the poor to deflect from the issue or the situation that is at hand. Okay, 
So before reading this, of course, I've heard of these. I've known people who have used this. I may myself have been guilty of using this. I've known throughout history of folks using whataboutisms. I didn't realize that there was an actual term um, for this. So I'm not going to try to be political. This might sound political, but it's the example I thought of. Uh, but one example of a whataboutism in our modern world might be someone saying, I feel really sorry when I see on the news about the immigrants on the border. Um, you know, I've read about them fleeing from, from drugs and violence. And someone responding to that person by saying, well, what about the homeless Americans that are living in Allentown? And if you've had that happen to you on either side, I would imagine that maybe the person that's saying what about does really care about homeless people in Allentown, and I wouldn't want to take that away from them. Um, but understanding the situation to be a situation of scarcity, of maybe um, not realizing that maybe we could talk about one issue and still be attentive to the other issue, um, maybe unintentionally trying to move someone away from the issue that was brought up, or maybe intentionally um, trying to deflect attention from that original issue. So if I find myself in that situation, often I find myself kind of sheepishly saying, well, of course, I, I do care about the homeless. Oh, geez, I feel terrible. And kind of say, oh, I'll just forget that original issue that I brought up. Um, so again, sometimes used unintentionally or just because we've, we picked that up, sometimes, as in the case of Judas, I think we can say, used very intentionally um, to deflect from the situation at hand. So what's really interesting about John's Gospel, and if you were reading this in the pews, uh, the Pew Bible, uh, John's Gospel uses parentheses, basically, to point out the whataboutism. So it's kind of, kind of convenient um, that he says, in parentheses, he says, Judas said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Uh, he kept the common purse and he used to steal what was put into it. Okay, so if Judas knows that the perfume um, was sold and given to the common purse, then he would have some benefits himself to, to that money, certainly, if it's straight out being able to take it. But at the same time, if he doesn't like what Mary's actions are symbolizing, he had his own motive to moving her away, um, a gift of abundance in a world that he wants to create as a gift of scarcity. Uh, so, how do you react to a whataboutism? What do you do with a whataboutism? And I think maybe, instead of allowing it to be shifting you and your thoughts away from what you were trying to bring up or this issue of concern or, or situation that you were doing, um, to acknowledge it. So maybe we could say to Judas, yeah, Judas, you're right. The poverty in um, our community, first century Palestine, is pretty bad. This divide between rich and poor. We really need to remember the poor in our giving. Um, but then not allow that to deflect or bury the issue that we've been bringing up. In the case of Mary, um, Jesus is here. I want to honor him. What extravagant love. So it's also interesting as an aside that what about isms um, were actually taken from the very end of this passage and used throughout history. Um, from the very end, that last verse that we heard from the passage today when Jesus says, you always will have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Many times, this passage has been pulled out, actually half of a verse has been pulled out, uh, for those who are addressing poverty concerns um, with a whataboutism, trying to address poverty, reforms, things that can help folks uh, move out of poverty, Perhaps the response has been throughout history, but didn't Jesus say you're always going to have the poor with you? And that what about them works pretty well when you say it with that inflection of, well, geez, if Jesus said that, who am I to challenge this? I mean, geez, oh, okay, maybe poverty is part of the reality, part of the order. 
If only people had realized that Jesus, of course, is quoting his own scripture, which he does a lot, um, being very much schooled in understanding uh, the Torah. And he's quoting uh, Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 through 11. And it's really fascinating to go back and read this where he mentions, where it's mentioned that the poor will be with you. So just briefly from Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, it says, Now if there are poor persons among you, uh, say to your fellow Israelites, don't be hard-fisted or hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your fellow in Israelites. On the contrary, open your hands wide to them, generously lend to them whatever they need. And it goes on. And then in verse 11, it says, poor persons will never disappear from the earth. That's why I'm giving you this command. You must open your hand generously to your fellow Israelites, to the needy among you, and the poor who live with you in your land. So Jesus is quoting Jewish law here in, in the last verse, um, which acknowledged that there will be poor people, there will always be poor people living in their land, but reminded them within that context not to forget them not to divert their attention to the, again, away from them, but instead to open their hearts, open their eyes to seeing them, always continuing to remember the poor among you. So maybe this passage now, if we take a step back from the whataboutisms and Judas's and Jesus' dialogue here, if we take a step back, what, maybe the, the entirety of this passage might show us a different response to whataboutisms um, by reminding us about the response of Mary's actions. So what does Mary do in this beautiful, grace-filled, abundant gift of love that she, she brings? Um, so starting with maybe the whole family, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It says very specifically, they gave a dinner. They gave a dinner to honor Jesus, to remember him to lift him up. They wanted to share their love through the gifts of their presence, through the gifts of hospitality, of their friendship. Um, they wanted to share their gratitude. Remember, Lazarus, this is the Lazarus who was resurrected from the dead. So uh, how do you repay somebody for that? You can't. But they wanted to show their gratitude and their presence of gift of love. Um, and they wanted to show that not through a typical reciprocal relationship. You know, you've raised me from the dead, so I'm going to sell this perfume and give you a big wad of cash. That's not what they wanted to do. Um, they wanted to show it by their presence of being able to serve Jesus. Um, we hear that Martha served Jesus, that Lazarus invites him to dinner. And then, of course, that Mary takes this pure nard, this uh, wonderfully smelling perfume, and shares it with Jesus in this gift of love. Okay, so here's what Mary does. She takes not just a little bit of perfume, and this is where we could have used all of your, your bottles of oils uh, that we heard on Wednesday nights, but here's um, just an interesting reaction to what, 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 what would have happened with the whole pound of perfume that Mary took. This is um, from the Iona community. They wrote about what they imagined it smelling like. Um, a pound of pure nard, uh, they described, the place smelled like the perfume department at a mall. It was as if someone bumped their elbow against a bottle and sent it crashing upon the floor, setting off the most expensive perfume bomb on earth. Um, and like I've been referring to on Wednesday night, we uh, were treated to Sharon Edinger providing us uh, a presentation on essential oils during our midweek Lenten programs. We've been, of course, talking about cultivating calm and confidence, and she led us in a discussion about smells and the ways that smells can cultivate changes within us. And we were talking specifically about the different essential oils, so physical, emotional, spiritual changes um, being made aware. And during the presentation, I was amazed to learn a little bit more about smells um, that, at least for me, I don't think we appreciate as much as sight or hearing. Um, we only have three receptors for sight, I learned, but we have a hundred different distinct classes of smell receptors. That means there's so many more triggers that smells um, 
can, can lead us to. So you can ask Christian if I'm wrong about this after the service, but I think we purchased our house perhaps based on smell. I remember when we came in to see our house for the first time, Christian saying, this smells like home. Now, I looked into the kitchen and I knew that they were burning a uh, fresh one of those candles or aroma things, a freshly baked pie candle. And so it, yes, it smelled like pie, but Christian, <laughs> smelt that and immediately triggered uh, to this sense of this is this is the one. Um, so it was a good choice. <laughs> but I'm sure that we all have different ways that smells have taken us or triggered us to certain memories. We talked about that on Wednesday a little bit. Um, the power of smells is really varied and, and really amazing. So Mary chose uh, this as the way that she was going to express uh, her love, her her just power and presence of Jesus being there with her. Uh, what did she pick? She picked nard, um, which is um, called today in spike nard. And by my calculations, using the website we were using, this would have cost today around $4,500 for this pound of spike nard. Um, it's sold in, ten, in five milliliter bottles, but here's a 10 milliliter bottle so of eardrop. Uh, so, 45 of these would be what Mary would have poured onto Jesus' feet. Uh, so if you can imagine, I didn't have that many bottles at home, but uh, imagine that, that kind of extravagance. So some of the translations tell us that Mary bought this um, and knew about Jesus' burial, that she bought it um, for Jesus' burial. It would have been no surprise for Mary, Martha, Lazarus to know about the threats that Jesus was under at this point in his ministry. Uh, he's been preaching, he's been teaching, he's been challenging the Roman authorities, the religious authorities, and so while they may not have known exactly when he was going to die, they knew of how much his life was in danger. So they knew all that, and again, as we hear, saving that for the time of his burial, but the thing that they knew right now was that they knew they had Jesus. They knew they had him in the flesh. They knew that this was a moment to celebrate together. Um, they had him alive to enjoy him and his life, to enjoy life in general, to have good food, serve each other, and break out the expensive nard to anoint. And so these 45 of these bottles are spread upon Jesus. And again, this expensive perfume balm is set off into the house. And I can imagine, and I'm just wondering if we can kind of imagine in our smells and our minds about how long this smell would have lasted. Um, it wasn't going to go away if this was the Saturday before Palm Sunday or the Friday before Palm Sunday when we think, it wouldn't go away by the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It wouldn't go away by the time that Jesus was overturning the temples, uh, the tables in the temple. It wouldn't go away by the time he was challenging, again, religious authorities or being faced with Pilate or being challenged uh, by Herod or being put um, with a, a crown of th thorns on his head and being led to the cross. I would imagine that smell of Mary's love would have lingered with him each and every day of this Holy Week up until the cross. And so I'm wondering, as Jesus set his face to Jerusalem and that, that Sunday uh, marching into Jerusalem, he would breathe in and he would smell love. As Jesus was facing Judas, again, this time as a betrayer, as he was facing Peter as a denier, would he again have breathed in and been reminded of love? As Jesus faced the accusations of the crowds, Pilate and Herod mocking crowds in a crown of thorns, would he breathe in and smell love? And when he wondered out loud on the cross, and those words, uh, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Uh, the pain of crucifixion, might we imagine that he breathed in and still could smell lingering um, a smell of love, an extravagant gift of love? 
So today's gospel passage gives us, I think, two ways to live. Um, we learn about the whataboutisms, maybe where we've been part of that or we know about it. Um, the ways that we can easily move ourselves to distract ourselves from being present in a moment, um, present in the needs. Or we can learn about how to be present, uh, to share a gift of love by sharing our own gifts generously with each other at the moment. I don't think Mary would have never known that that Nard would have carried Jesus and what was coming in the next week exactly, uh, but that, that gift of love would linger and carry him uh, all the way to the cross. So I wanted to preach a whole nether sermon, which I'm not going to, um, but the, in a few days, I'll be sharing uh, a YouTube link about the Campbell lecture that we had on Thursday night with David Lamont, and it was titled, What's Mine to Do? And I hope that maybe if you've heard this, you might reference um, and, and watch that link, um, because he is really talking about how a very small gift of, of love, and the case that he's using is around the civil rights movement, and just that some small, very mundane gifts of love, like making photocopies before the Montgomery bus boycott, um, really triggered in a whole movement of change. So some fascinating stuff that ties in here, but as I started writing it, I thought, well, you're all gonna rebel. So make that connection if you would. But for now, let's think about where um, that wondrous gift of love, of um, that pure nard that was shared and lingered and maybe where we can have uh, an impact of a small but wondrous gift of love that we can share. Amen. Which leads us into a song about wondrous gifts of love. Uh, our closing hymn will be 328, What Wondrous Love Is This? Uh, please stand.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.